Hi everyone, so in this video on genetic technology uh, we're going to have a quick overview of the process and then we're going to look in detail at the different ways that we can obtain the genes that we want to use. So first of all for an overview I'm going to use the example of genetically engineered insulin. So normally um, the pancreas would transcribe the insulin gene and produce the insulin protein but if there's something faulty with that gene then the protein is not going to be produced um, and so the person has diabetes. So in this case what we have to do is we have to inject insulin which means we have to get the insulin from um, another source and in the past what's, what we've done is we've taken it from pigs so we've used pig insulin but there are quite a lot of problems with that um, not least ethical issues. So we need to get the insulin some, from somewhere else. So this is where genetic engineering can be used because if we can take um, a different person who has got uh, the insulin gene that is working, uh, so their pancreas is producing insulin normally. But if from that other person we could take that gene for insulin, um, then we could get uh, we we could produce the insulin using that gene um, from somebody else. So to do this, what we'd have to do is we'd have to first of all extract the gene, so we'd take it out of the person somehow, and then we'd have to make lots of copies of that particular gene, so this is cloning the gene, um, and then once we've got lots of copies of the gene, we'd have to somehow try to um, insert it into a host cell, so some kind of a cell, usually a bacterial cell. So this bacterial cell has now managed to take up the, uh, the gene, for insulin, for human insulin. And we uh, we do that lots of times and sometimes it would be successful and the host cell would take up the gene and sometimes it would be unsuccessful and the host cell would not take up the gene. So we'd have to have some way of um, being able to tell whether or not the host cell has managed to take up the gene successfully or not. And once we could do that, then we could get rid of the host cells that have not been successful. And now we know we've got a population of bacterial cells which have, in this case, the human insulin gene in them. So what we can do then is we can mass produce those bacterial cells. And those bacterial cells are going to transcribe and translate that insulin gene and produce insulin. So we're going to end up with lots and lots of human insulin being produced by these bacterial cells, which we can then use to inject um, for our diabetic patients. And that means that we don't have to use pigs anymore. So this is a good example of how we can use genetic engineering. So this is now going to look in detail at the ways we can obtain the gene in the first place. So the first example is synthesis. So in this case, we don't need any sort of DNA template. We just need to know the code. So the, uh, the, the sequence of nucleotides for the gene that we're interested in. And then we need a free supply of nucleotides and in the laboratory it's possible to assemble those nucleotides in the correct sequence so that we end up uh, with sorry so that we end up with our um, our gene of interest the second way we could get the gene is using a process called tr reverse transcription so normally transcription is when you would start off with a template strand of DNA and then you'd use that to make a complementary messenger RNA strand. Reverse transcription is the opposite. So what you would do is you'd start off with a strand of messenger RNA. Now this messenger RNA can be taken from cells. Um, so in our insulin example, if you have cells that are producing insulin, there'll be lots of copies of messenger RNA for the insulin gene. So you can extract those strands of messenger RNA for that gene. Once you've got the messenger RNA, use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase and a supply of free nucleotides. And you can then assemble a complementary strand of DNA. So cDNA means complementary DNA, complementary to the strand of messenger RNA, which you're using as a template. So you can build it up. Um, and I'm just using the colours here to represent the complementary base pairing. So this strand of DNA is complementary to this strand of messenger RNA. 
So now you've got a single strand of DNA, but we need a double strand. So what we would do now is we would take our complementary DNA. So this strand here is used here as a template. And then we would use the enzyme DNA polymerase plus our free nucleotides to then build a second strand of DNA. And now we've got double stranded DNA for the gene that we're interested in. The third method of obtaining the gene is using enzymes called restriction endonucleases. Uh, we'll look at this in more detail in a second, but the basic idea is that you have your um, you have your section of DNA and you know where the gene is, so you know the, the sequence of the gene and you know the sequence on either side of the gene and you use the enzymes to cut above and below where the gene is and then you can remove the gene. So once we've got our gene we need to insert it into our host cell um, but we don't directly take the gene and put it into our host cell. What we do is we take the gene and we usually use a vector um, and that's usually a plasmid. So our plasmid is, um, this is not to scale, but our plasmid is a circular piece of DNA from a bacterial cell and we would cut that plasmid, so you cut the, the DNA in the plasmid using an enzyme open up the plasmid and then what you can do is you can take the gene and you can insert it into the plasmid and then you can insert the plasmid into the host cell. So this host cell now contains the plasmid but that plasmid has got the, G uh, the gene of interest so for example our insulin gene in there and then when this host cell, this bacterial cell just goes about its regular um, transcription and translation so its regular protein synthesis process it will transcribe that gene that's in the plasmid as well. So what I want to look at now is something called sticky ends. So this is involving uh, the, uh, the method of obtaining a gene where you use restriction endonuclease enzymes. So here we've got our section of DNA which contains our gene. So to obtain the gene we need to um, cut the DNA and we use our restriction endonuclease enzymes to do that. So there are lots of different kinds of endonuclease, uh, restriction endonuclease enzymes. Um, they all cut at, at a particular base sequence. Some of them uh, would cut straight through but what you can see here is it's cutting in a staggered fashion. Um, and again remember I'm using the different colours to represent our different bases CGAT so this particular restriction endonuclease is cutting uh, where you get the sequence green, green, red, and it will cut in that step fashion. So we can use our restriction endonuclease enzyme, and if you look at the gene sequence here, this enzyme has found the same uh, sequence here and the same sequence here, so it's cut in two different places. The position where a restriction endonuclease enzyme cuts is called a recognition site or a recognition sequence. Okay, so if we take our plasmid, obviously a plasmid is circle, uh, a circle of DNA. I've just shown a small section of it here. So this is just a small section of a plasmid. What we can do is we can cut this plasmid to open it up so that we can insert our gene. And we can cut it also with a restriction endonuclease enzyme. And what we've done here is we've cut it with the same restriction endonuclease enzyme that we used up here. So that means it's got the same recognition sequence. So in our gene of interest, so this was, uh, for example, uh, where our insulin gene is, the insulin gene would be in this middle section here. And we've used a restriction endonuclease, which is going to cut just above the gene and just below the gene. So we know that the gene is going to be in here. So to do this, you have to know the whole sequence of DNA to be able to identify where you can cut it and then use the right restriction endonuclease enzyme. So if we know that we've used the enzyme which is cutting green, green, red like this in a step fashion, 
and then we look at our plasmid DNA, it's also cut green, green, red. It's cut at the same place because it has the same recognition sequence because it's the same restriction endonuclease enzyme. So now we've cut our plasmid, we can open it up and this means that we can now take our gene and we can insert it. And this is where the sticky ends ideas come in. So if we're going to, uh, we're going to insert this section and obviously we've cut it here. So this section is uh, removed and this section is removed and we end up just with this middle section here. And you can see we've got this stagger, this step at the end. And we've also got the same step in our plasmid. And because we use the same restriction endonuclease enzyme with the same restriction um, recognition sequence, we've now got complementary base pairs on the ends of the gene and the plasmid. So if you have a look at the sequence here and here, they're complementary to one another. And equally, the sequence here and here, they're complementary to one another. Which means that we can take this gene here and we can insert it into our plasmid DNA like that. And the base pairs here are complementary and the base pairs here are complementary. What we have to do then is use an enzyme called DNA ligase uh, to uh, bond together here, so to um, make the sugar phosphate backbone complete. And once we've done that, then we have our recombinant DNA, which is our plasmid DNA with our um, new gene taken from another source inserted into it. Okay, that's all. Thank you.